right, everybody. Uh, welcome back to another installment of the Ethics Law and Society Forum. Uh, so if you've ever been on the internet, you'll want to pay special attention to today's guest, Corinne McSherry. Uh, Dr. McSherry is, let me make sure I get this right, the legal director of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. And for those of you who haven't followed EFF, they've been doing really important work to protect our liberties in the digital age. Um, Dr. McSherry specializes in intellectual property, open access, free speech. As a litigator, she's focused um, on defending online fair use and political expression. And as a litigator, she's represented uh, Lawrence Lessig, who you may have noticed was running for president until very recently, uh, as, where, as well as um, a dancing baby and other fun things. Um, her policy work includes leading EFF's uh, effort to fix copyright to promote net neutrality and best practices for online expression. Um, she wisely graduated from my alma mater, UC Santa Cruz, go slugs. And uh, then she went on to get her PhD at UC San Diego and a JD from Stanford Law. And now you can find her commenting in NPR and the New York Times and uh, Fox News and CBS News and now Sonoma State. Uh, so please uh, join me in welcoming Corinne McSherry to SSU. Hi, everybody. Sorry, I'm a little bit late. I got lost. On my way to San Francisco? You know, I shouldn't have because it's not that hard. Um, so, yeah, hi. Uh, how many of you guys know what EFF is or has ever heard of where I work? Okay, so let me just give you a quick, quick rundown because it'll help explain why I focus on these kinds of things. So EFF's been around for about 25 years now. We just celebrated our 25th anniversary. And for our entire existence, we're a nonprofit organization, and we focus on protecting your digital rights. So pretty much all things internet, we have our hands in it. Um, most of our work is legal, so I'm, I'm a, the head of the legal team. We're 14 lawyers, and we focus on what's called impact litigation, which is the kind of litigation where you go to court because you're trying to change the law, make the law better, um, or sometimes just protect the freedoms that we currently have. Um, so that's a lot of our work is, um, is going to court. Um, we also fight for your freedoms in Congress. So we work to improve um, the law. And um, in that when, when it's not working in the courts, sometimes you got to go to Congress. And sometimes when it's not working in Congress, you got to go to the courts. We do it all. We also have an activism team. And um, they sort of get the word out about the work that we're doing and also try to um, educate people about important issues like net neutrality and copyright and privacy. Um, and we also have a set, a set of technologists who are, are working to protect your privacy online using technological means. So um, providing tools so you can track who's tracking you as you wend your way through the internet. So we're sort of like ACLU for the internet and we love it and it's a really fantastic job and we um, do take interns. So. If you're interested for an interested in an interesting internship, uh, reach out to us. Okay, but that's not why I'm here. I'm here to talk to you guys about copyright and end user license agreements and why you should care about them. Um, because part of our work is actually, um, I do a lot of work on copyright issues, and the reason is we have this area of law that's supposed to protect and encourage creative expression, but sometimes it actually gets in the way of uh, creative expression and also what's happened is that copyright is sort of showing up in all kinds of weird places So actually all kinds of people who never thought they had to worry about copyright issues now they have to um, So let me show you why Okay, the key thing is this Software is now ubiquitous, right? So you have software in your computer and you have a computer in This right, but you also have a computer in your car You might have a computer in your refrigerator You've probably got all kinds of computers there at various parts of your house. All of those are running on software, right? And if wherever you have software, um, all of these places, game consoles and cars, um, wherever you have software, you have copyright because software is protected by copyright law. Now that in and of itself isn't the problem. Um, I mean, some people think it is the problem that we don't need copyright protection for software, but leave that aside for the moment, okay? Don't have to worry about that. Uh, the point is, though, that if you have software, you have copyright, and if you have copyright, you have restrictions, right? 
copyright law comes with a set of restrictions on what you can and cannot do with that software. Um, so you can think of it this way. When you're driving your car around, you own your car, but the software in that car that helps it run better, you don't own that. You license that, and that means you don't control it. Um, so as a practical matter, this plays out in two important ways. <laughs> so very often, if you've got software embedded in whatever your device is, whether it's your car, or your phone, or your game console, or your refrigerator, or your toaster, we've got toasters yet, but only a matter of time. It's probably protected by some kind of digital rights management software. Basically, it's probably subject to some kind of digital lock that the, man the manufacturer has put on it <coughs> because they, well, there's a lot of reasons why they might put a digital lock on it, but the basic thing is they don't want it to be reproduced and they don't want people tinkering with it. So they make it hard to do that by putting a little lock on it. Um, that too, in and of itself, isn't the problem because lots and lots of smart people know how to break those locks. Pretty much go online, anything you want, plug in your device, it'll tell you how to break the DRM on that device if that's something that you want to do, which many people do. So for example, there's a digital lock on your iPhone and you need to break, it's very, very, very easy to break that lock so that you can run apps that Apple didn't approve of, um, which is a lot of people like to do. So it's easy to do it if you want to do it, but it's also illegal. And that's thanks to this little area of copyright law, section 1201 of the Digital Millennium Copyright Act. This is the one, you know, if you take nothing else away from this, you should know that the only thing that part of copyright law you really need to know about is the Digital Millennium <coughs> Copyright Act because there's two parts of it. The good part of it is called Section 512, and it lays out a bunch of safe harbors um, that are why we have the internet that we have today. Basically, it, it, it creates a, it's a whole system whereby service providers like <coughs> YouTube, Google, Facebook, Twitter, and all of those, um, if they follow certain <coughs> rules, they can't be held liable for copyright infringement using their services. This is important because they wouldn't exist if they didn't have that protection. This is the bad part of the DMCA. This is Section 1201, it's the flip side. So Section 1201 says, you can, basically it makes it illegal to break the locks on the software in all of your devices, on, on anything, um, in and of itself, even if you're doing it for a perfectly legal reason, like you just wanna fix your car, right? Which is a legal thing to do, but if you have to break a digital lock to do it, that in itself, is illegal. Now, the reason why we got this is like, take yourself back to 1998 if you can, just imagine. It's 1998. And the Hollywood, you know, the big content industries are freaking out. There's piracy everywhere. It's only gonna get worse. How can we possibly protect ourselves? How can we defend ourselves against all these evil pirates? So they said, I know what let's do. Um, we're going to put DRM on DVDs in particular and CDs and everyone else. We're going to put all these digital locks on all of this content that we are selling. And as a backup to that, we're going to make it illegal to break the locks on that content, on those DVDs or whatever else. Um, and that will hopefully discourage the pirates from being pirates. And it'll at least make it difficult for even like the good guys um, will discourage them from maybe ripping that DVD, which maybe they were going to do it for a legal reason, but then they post it online and then someone else steals from them and it ends up getting used for, for, for evil. Now, as it turns out, this didn't work at all because the penalties for copyright infringement are quite high already. So the people who sort of like are large-scale commercial copiers who are making things available for profit, which are presumably the people that they care about the most, they don't care about this law, right? They're already on the hook for copyright infringement. They're already in big trouble. So adding this little extra thing was not important to them and discouraged no one from doing anything. But that was the idea. 
Um, and it's still true. So now there's like, you know, there's various streaming services, there's DRM on that. You know, they'll still use DRM and they'll still invoke this law <coughs> to try to discourage infringement, which was again its original purpose. Um, but here's what's also happened that I don't think they anticipated in 1998, which is where I started, that software became ubiquitous. So now you've got copyright everywhere. We're not talking about just a digital lock on a DVD that might make it difficult for you to rip that DVD. Um, you can't even use DVDs anymore, but anyway. Um, the, um, now you've got software everywhere and you've got digital locks everywhere. And, if, and what that means is that if you want to interact with your devices in legal ways, you need to break those digital locks, but now you've broken copyright law. And most people, don't know that. Most people don't realize when they're doing that that they actually are violating copyright law. There's very significant penalties for doing this. You can actually go to jail. And there's very fin significant financial penalties. Um, so what that means is, as I said, there's no freedom to tinker. And that's because lots of, basically it impedes your ability to just interact with your devices in the way that you would normally expect. And the example that everybody sort of gets right away, and it's a real world example, is your car. So you have software in your car. We have a long tradition in this country of people fixing their own cars or taking it to their independent repair guy as opposed to the manufacturer. The car talk guys told me for years that's what I was supposed to do. Um, and, or maybe also modifying cars. People, there's a long tradition of that too. And people expect to be able to do that and not have to go back to the manufacturer every time for permission. Well, if what you want to do involves messing with the software in your car, which it increasingly is going to do because your car is basically just a, a computer on wheels, you may have to violate the law to do it. Or your independent repair guy might have to, or a woman might have to break the law in order to do that. And they have to break copyright law, which I don't think anybody, no, you know, you go to mechanic school, no one teaches you copyright law. And because why? It's just ridiculous. Um, similarly, tractors. Would any farmer in all the world think they needed to know anything about copyright law? Of course not. They've got other things to worry about. But the same thing applies there. You can't fix your tractor because there's software in your tractor. And, um, and John Deere is very firm that they don't want you mucking with that software. So <coughs> there is a process that exists in the world where you can get an exemption from this law. So what you need to do, if you want to repair your car or tinker with your device, you can go to the copyright office and ask for permission. Um, and every th you have to do it every three years. So there's a three year cycle. So hopefully you'll fall within that cycle. And you go to the copyright office and say, can I have an exemption for, from this rule so I can do this otherwise legal thing that I want to do? Um, and if you're lucky and you make a really good argument and you're, you have a lot of time and energy to file a lot of documents with the Copyright Office and testify at hearings and answer follow-up questions and the gods are smiling on you, you could get that exemption. And then two years later you can do it again and again and again and again because it's, not, it's never permanent. It's only a three-year exemption. Um, <laughs> we just went through this process at YAPAP, as did many other people, asking for exemptions for various things. And um, it took a year of really hard labor, a lot of people, and but we got them. We got a lot of them. Uh, but now we have this mishmash world where so some kinds of tinkering are okay, some kinds of tinkering aren't. Who knows which one? I don't think you can expect ordinary consumers to actually be able to keep track of this. Um, so one of the things we went for was your right to repair uh, your tractor and your car, um, either for, for purposes of repair, tinkering, modification, or also research. So you guys may remember, well, I don't know, it was a month ago? <laughs> anyway, not, not remember, but there, there's a currently an issue still about VW, right? And VW breaking the law with their software and using software to trick the emissions testers. Um, well, there's a lot of people who like to do research on cars that actually can discover things like that, but they might have to tinker with the DRM to be able to do that. 
car manufacturers really don't want them to be able to do that. And in the process of the, uh, us going to the copyright office, we made arguments about why people should be able to tinker with the software for security and other kinds of research. And the car manufacturers came out in force, insisting that would be terrible. That would be awful. You can't possibly ever be able to do that. And um, John Deere came out in force and said, you can't tinker with the software in your tractor. They were, and then they had a lot of explaining to do to the farmers of America, which was pretty great. They had to do all this PR because farmers were like, what? Um, but, so we won these exemptions, but only for a little while. So right now, the current state of play, you can jailbreak your phone or your tablet for now. <coughs> you can't jailbreak the game console um, for now. You can't um, rip a DVD for space shifting purposes, but you can rip a DVD, which means like you want to watch it in a different place that's not necessarily authorized. You can't do that, but you can rip a DVD in order to make a remix video. So just you have to keep in mind, what am I doing? Why am I ripping? And depending on what your purpose is, it might be lawful, it might not be. Um, you can tinker with the DRM in order to fix your car, but we have to wait a year till that goes into effect because the Copyright Office um, wants the EPA to have a chance to weigh in on it. Um, even though if you break environmental laws, you're already breaking environmental laws, so it's not like a copyright problem, but anyway. Um, so these things are all legal. You can't, however, help someone else do any of these things. So that's another wrinkle on this. So you can get an exemption for the act of doing something if you do it yourself. So I can jailbreak my phone, but I can't help any of you jailbreak your phones because that falls under a different category, and I'm not even getting get into it, but basically, it's that, that basically I would be providing you with tools to assist you in doing something that's otherwise completely legal, and providing tools is never legal. So, and I can fix my own car, but I can't take it to the independent repair shop. So, hope, you know, if you're good at fixing your own car, that's great, we helped you, um, but we didn't help your mechanic, I'm sorry to say. And we couldn't. We tried, but we couldn't. Um, and all of this is under the purview of a copyright <coughs> office. So we went, we're going to the copyright office to ask for permission to do things like mess with your own devices. And the copyright office is probably not really the right place to have a veto right on innovation. I mean, they're librarians. They're, you know, and they're librarians and they're lawyers and they're not technologists. But nonetheless, they've been given this job of figuring this out for people. All right, so what else? The other thing that's impeding your ability to control your stuff that you interact with every day all the time is something called end user license agreements. So as I was saying at the beginning, software, you don't own the software in your stuff. You license the software in your stuff. Um, and that means that somewhere along the line, you probably clicked I agree to some big, long form contract that you didn't read, no one reads them. It's actually been empirically proven that no one reads them. It's like a known thing. Because why, because there, and actually someone did a study of like, what if we all actually read the contracts that we agreed to all day long? It was like so many person hours, <coughs> there was like a, gonna be a massive drain on the economy. So really, economically, it's not good for you to read <laughs> these contracts, but you're agreeing to a lot. Nonetheless, courts will uphold them even if you didn't read them, as long as you clicked I agree. And there's been case after case where people have gone to court and said, look, no one, I didn't read this contract. I wasn't even aware of it. I didn't realize what I was doing. The court says, I don't care. It's a contract. You clicked I agree. You affirmed. You, you assented. And so it's enforceable <laughs> against you. Too bad. And the problem with these agreements, aside from the fact that they're everywhere, I mean, probably you clicked two this morning and you don't even know it. Well, you maybe, hopefully you know you clicked agree, but you didn't read what you were doing. Um, the problem with EULAs is twofold. One is, unless we call them EULAs, one is they're called contracts of adhesion. A contract of adhesion is one that you don't have an, op an opportunity to negotiate. I mean, if you, if you guys go to law school, you can learn all about this. I won't bore you with it all now. Um, but... That is the basic idea. It's a contract that you are not allowed to negotiate. And so 
partly that's what's called procedurally unconscionable. People think like procedurally that's unacceptable. But that doesn't make them unenforceable unless they're substantively unconscionable. So if you agree to a mass contract <coughs> where you sold yourself into slavery, that's not enforceable. Just in case you're worried. No one can enforce that against you. But lots of other things are enforceable. <coughs> um, it has to be against public policy for it to be not an enforceable contract at all. So these contracts that we all agree to, these mass contracts, are generally enforceable, as I've said. Um, whether or not you read them, and whether or not you agree them. So what's in these contracts? A lot of restrictions on your ability to use your stuff. So there's restrictions on your ability to mess with the software. That's basic. It's there all the time. Um, and what that can mean is that not just because maybe you want to tinker with the software in your device, but also maybe some young startup <coughs> wants to tinker with the software in the device so that they can provide you some additional service that the original manufacturer isn't giving. Um, but if they may not be able to do that because then they're interfering with your contract, and that's illegal too. Um, often you waive all kinds of consumer protections. Um, you wa may waive your free speech rights. So there's contracts where you agree that you won't, so you won't disparage the product that you are, um, what you, bought. you won't say anything mean about your device. And you agreed to that in this contract, but again, you didn't read. <coughs> um, there's restrictions on your ability to give your stuff away when you're done with it, or even lend it. There'll be all kinds of restrictions that'll say you can't lend this to anybody, um, and you can't give it away. When it's done, you have to return it to the manufacturer. Again, no one reads these, but they're in there, and, and everybody's bound by them. Um, you may waive your privacy protection, so you may agree that the manufacturer can monitor your activity um, using the device. So there's all kinds of devices where they'll do what we call phoning home. <coughs> They're basically sending information back to the original manufacturer about like your location, what you're searching for, how you're using the device, other programs, like if it's a computer, other programs on the computer. Um, there's a lot of information about you and your life, and you don't know it's getting sent back to the manufacturer, but you've agreed to it, so you know, don't complain. Um, there's also what's called impediments to preservation, and basically what that is is that librarians are taking this a lot. So they want to acquire music digitally, so, and they want to be able to preserve it, because that's what they do, they're librarians, they're archivists, that's key. Um, and probably lots of musicians want to have that music preserved, because they want to be, you know, obviously they're making music for the ages, um, but if you can only acquire that music digitally, via a contract, that contract is going to include restrictions that make it possible for librarians to do that. Um, usually for perfectly good reasons, right? They're thinking about like, well, we don't want unauthorized copies of this music being made. That's how what the music labels are thinking about. But the librarians are thinking, yeah, but now I can't actually do something perfectly legal because it's against this contract that I agreed to. So I'll give you an example. This is a, um, the Energy License Agreement for Xbox uh, 360. So this is very standard language. So you can't use unauthorized software or hardware to access the services, the game services, nor modify an authorized device, that's your console, in any unauthorized way through unauthorized repairs, upgrades, or downloads. So basically that means if your game, so game console breaks, you have to go back to the manufacturer to get it fixed. You can't do anything else because you've agreed that you won't do anything else. Um, and that means that it's really hard for like independent repair shops to continue to exist because their customers are you know, basically they, they're not allowed to have customers. Right? So customers are forbidden from going to them. And so, and every now and then, um, you'll have some raid on some small little shop just to sort of send a message to everybody else that they shouldn't be doing this. Um, there are limits on Euros, which is good. So, you know, there are, for example, you need to have an opportunity to review the terms that you agree to. What that means is a practical matter is something needs to pop up on your screen and you actually have an opportunity to look at it. Turns out in practice that's not accomplishing all that much, but okay. Um, there's limits on sometimes if you violate the contract, you might be violating copyright law, which has really significant penalties. And sometimes you're just violating contract law and that has lower penalties, but I don't. The fact of the matter, these aren't 
really super useful limit. <coughs> uh, mostly because smart people like me will just rewrite contracts in some different way that makes it more enforceable. <coughs> Um, so, why should we worry about this? We should worry about this because I think that we're creating a world in which a lot of the traditional rights and expectations that I at least grew up with, and I hope you all grew up with, are going away. A lot of the sort of ideas that we have that I think are actually kind of like American ideas, which is that we mess, we tinker with our stuff. We own our stuff. When you buy something, you expect that that is yours. Right? You don't expect to be renting it. You expect to be owning it. Uh, but increasingly, those rights are going away. And we aren't as aware of it as we should be. Um, and we should be pushing back on that. Another thing, the cost of it, which I alluded to earlier, is we're not getting some of the innovation that we should be getting. Because small startups that could be doing that innovation, that could be giving us cool add-on services for our devices, like new layers on top of our, you know, our our games, right? But also like new services that would interact with our cars, with our any any of our connected devices. They can't do that add-on innovation because they're <coughs> forbidden from doing it by all of this sort of this web of restrictions. And so that's creating a situation where like, you're tied forever back to the original manufacturer of the device that you bought, right? And they have increasing amounts of sort of control <coughs> over your options and over your choices. Um, and that means just we're, there's all the innovation that we don't even know we're missing because we're never going to see it because it, it just can't happen because because um, venture capitalists will invest in startups where they think you're going to be taken down by a lawsuit right away and you're not going to be able to survive. Um, every now and then they will invest in that. I mean, YouTube got their investors, but it's hard. The good news is there are some paths forward. Um, one thing that's happening right now is there's a lot of discussion about copyright reform. Um, going back to the, the car research issue. So when we applied for our exemption, we didn't anticipate the whole VW thing. But that made Congress sit up and take notice and say, wait a minute, it seems crazy that you have to go to the Librarian of Congress to ask for permission to do research on a car that could actually protect public safety. That <coughs> seems wrong. That seems improper. So a lot of folks in Congress are getting interested in fixing at least that piece of the law. I think they need to do a heck of a lot more, but I'll take what I can get. Um, there's also a number of states that are passing right to repair laws. And basically, these are laws that will limit manufacturers' ability to restrict your ability to repair your stuff. Um, they sort of get that this is harming small businesses and this is harming innovation. And that's something that they can do on a state level. So, um, and also there's other laws that are requiring manufacturers to like make repair information available. And it seems like, you know, kind of basic, but there's some manufacturers that won't even let you see the manual in your car. And that's, you know, pretty nuts. Or they'll do, this is another thing, they'll claim that they own what's called diagnostic codes. So nowadays when you take your car to the repair shop, they plug it in, to a machine, and the machine tells basically tells them what's wrong with your car using these diagnostic codes. So different manufacturers use different codes. <coughs> Why don't they don't standardize? I don't know, but anyway, they don't. So um, they, use, they all use different codes, and then I know they try to they try to claim copyright in those codes. So they'll say to the repair guy, "Oh, okay, we'll tell you what the codes are. We'll give you the the latest version of the codes." And that'll just be $50,000, please. So, and oh, if you don't pay, well, too bad. Then you can't stay in business anymore. <coughs> um, another thing that I think should happen is what's called preemption. Preemption is when federal law trumps state law. Now, the way that that would work here is that one of the things that happens with EULAs is you waive all these rights, right, in these license agreements. So we could have a federal law, and folks were talking about it, I was at a hearing yesterday, actually, with a number of Congress people, and we all talked about this, that um, you make a, put a provision in the copyright law that would actually do some good for the world, and say, you can't waive these rights in a contract. 
these, con these rights are unwaivable. Um, and that would mean the federal law would preempt um, contracts. That would be great. I think that's something that's on the table. We'll see. All this is part of a larger discussion that is going to keep going for your immediate futures. And so you should actually think about ways that you can engage with it, which is there's a large discussion in Congress about um, reforming copyright law in three <coughs> fundamental ways. And we want to make sure that that reform happens in a way that protects innovation, that protects your speech rights, that protects your freedom to tinker. Um, there are other people who want to reform that law in a way that makes penalties for copyright infringement ever higher and that makes it, you know, well, you can ask them what they think, but ways that I think will, it will impede your fair use rights and your, and your free speech rights and impede the ability of people to innovate. Um, because when you make the penalties for copyright infringement too high or you have tools for policing infringement that are too strong, you actually end up getting in the way of lawful things that we want to do, like taking it back to 1201. Right? 1201 was passed for a laudable purpose to try to discourage infringement, but it caused all kinds of collateral damage. All of which is to say, this is going to be a discussion that's going to be happening in Congress. My organization is going to be heavily involved in it, and we are going to be, at various points, trying to rally folks like you guys to call your Congress people, email, tweet, talk about it, make your views known, Pay attention to what's happening with copyright law because copyright law actually ends up shaping your ability <coughs> to do what you want with your stuff. It's increasingly shaping your sort of basic rights and expectations, and so it's something you really need to worry about. So go to EFF.org, join our mailing list, um, or at least you know follow our deep links blog, and uh, we'll keep you informed on what's going on. So. I am supposed to leave you some time for questions, so I will shut up now and let you guys have questions. Yes. Um, how different is the enforcement from um, like individual versus like business or company? Because I know that seventh grade me definitely joke with their eyes on how much trouble my career. Well, seventh grade you, let's see, how long ago was that? Long time. <laughs> well, no, it's been long. So jailbreaking no, your phone has been legal for six years, for seven years, okay. because Good. EFF Good. got an exemption for it. Um, yeah. Seven years ago, and we got to go back every three years, and we get it again um, because it turns out that it wasn't a problem. Actually, jailbreaking is funny because Apple fought really hard against the jailbreaking exemption for iPhones, yeah, sure. and then it turns out they did, their business didn't fail and nothing bad happened, and so after that they stopped fighting it because there's no point. So then you said this is basically business motivated, so they're going to go after businesses more than they're going to go after individual people. Well, see, here's the thing. This is the thing with copyright in general, is that it's hard to predict. So rationally, um, there's no point in going after individual users. It's expensive, and it's not really worth it. But what we have seen over time is that um, ideas about this, content owners are not always rational, and manufacturers are not always rational. So what can happen periodically is someone will decide, no, we're going to go after individual users because we want to send a message. And it's sort of like lawsuit as education. Um, and so, for example, the RIAA, the Recording Industry Association of America, for a while was suing individual um, users for file sharing music. And that turned out to be kind of a bad idea. Um, it, they, they spent a lot of money on lawyers, so lawyers did great. Um, but they also got a lot of flack for it because people thought that was kind of unfair and, you know, you know all these situations where it was like, there was the seven year or nine year old was actually doing the file sharing, and the mom was the one who got sued. And was she going to rat out her kid? No, so of course she settles. And it seemed unfair and it seemed like coerced settlements. Um, but that does happen on occasion, is that there'll just be a decision to go after individuals to send a message, even though it doesn't really make a lot of sense. But more often, it's the, the bigger fear to me is the one that we don't see, which is so all the apps. Think of all the apps that might not exist if people weren't able to jailbreak their phones. Um, but since they are, we have this actually burgeoning marketplace of apps for jailbreaking phones, jailbreaking phones that maybe wouldn't exist otherwise. Other questions? Yes. So, um, how far along are those like uh, are those laws you were talking about that protect certain rights? Uh, 
Like, are they are they in their infant stages, or are they pretty far along? Those ones that are like the unalienable. <laughs> so the ideas are all on the table. We have a ways to go. So what's been happening is the House Judiciary Committee, Chairman Goodlatte, in his infinite wisdom, decided three years ago that this was going to be his his legacy. He was going to rewrite copyright law for the next 50 years. Because the last time we had a major rewrite to copyright law was 1976, and it was already outdated then by the time they got it passed. So this is supposed to be the next, you know, for the next 25 years or uh, 50 years. Um, he's been holding hearings for two years, and they're almost finished. There was one yesterday. There's one right now in L.A. Actually, they went on tour. They left D.C., which was amazing. Um, and so they had a hearing in Silicon Valley um, yesterday, and then there'll be one tomorrow, and then there'll probably be one more, and then they have to get down to writing. So we got a few years out, to be honest with you. This isn't, you know, otherwise this would be a different conversation that we'd be having. Um, but I think that it is definitely going to move forward, and it's really time, and it's going to be big. It's going to be big when we get there. And you're saying the best thing we could probably do is to write Congress people and uh, make it known on the internet? Or is well, there something else? so there's two things you could do right now. You don't have to wait for this copyright reform. Um, if you go to EFF.org, um, we have an action center. <coughs> and there is a law that's, um, that's Representative Zoe Lofgren, just down the way, um, has submitted that would basically fix 1201 anyway. Because it would say that if you are breaking the lock for a lawful purpose, you don't have to get an exemption. As long as what you're doing is not tied to copyright infringement, it's fine. So it re basically rewrites 1201 to, so that we don't have to go back to the Copyright Office every three years and ask for exemptions for otherwise legal things. Um, so that, and also Senator Wyden also has a bill. So if you go to our action center as well, I'm not trying to flog EFF, I promise. It's just this is the easiest way I know of to do it. Um, so there's two copyright bills that are pending right now. And so you can um, send in your support for those bills right away using our action center, which makes it really easy to email your, your um, congressperson. So you can do that right now. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I have friends with that guy. Um, other questions? Okay, well, thank you very much.